So first of all, welcome everyone to uh, Life in Neurosurgery, Thoughts and Reflections, uh, featuring Professor, uh, Professor Rolando Del Maestro of McGill University. I'm going to take a little bit of time in introducing our initiative. Uh, my name is Simon, along with Pedro Man Mohamed. Uh, we have uh, created this group called the Canadian Medical Student Interest Group in Neurosurgery, also known as CAMSign. Uh, this is a very new initiative. Uh, our mission, of course, is to uh, foster interest in neurosurgical studies and research among medical students who aspire to go to the field. And uh, our secondary goal is to provide students with resources, uh, presentations, a CARMS application uh, uh, advice that will be coming in later after this cycle, and also a mentorship and mentee relationship so uh, people can be more immersed in the field of neurosurgery. Another goal that we have is encouraging women to also pursue neurosurgery given that uh, women are unfortunately underrepresented in the field and this is a primary mission that we strongly believe in. So we really hope that this is an educational experience for everyone and uh, we are very pleased to, to have all of you here joining us on a Monday and uh, it's, it's really wonderful. So I will then uh, begin by uh, introducing the event and uh, we will begin. Be before I do that as a preface, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself during the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, Professor Delmeister is more than willing to take the questions. And again, this is designed for everyone to, to really get a better sense of insight from, uh, from really an expert world leader in the field. And if you feel more comfortable and you would prefer to have it in the chat, we will be moderating the chat and make sure, making sure that uh, the questions are answered. And then after the presentation, there will still be some time to ask questions and we will be here with you. Okay, so let's now get to the, the big part. So we're very honored and grateful to have uh, Professor Del Maestro uh, with us today for our first keynote lecture of 2020, uh, A Life in Neurosurgery. Uh, Professor Del Maestro is a Canadian neurosurgeon, scientist, innovator, uh, who, leads the dire uh, who leads the Neurosurgical Simulation and Artificial Intelligence uh, Learning Center Laboratory here at McGill. Uh, he has led uh, brain research laboratories at Western University, uh, before joining McGill in the year 2000. Uh, with over 40 years of accumulated valuable experience, he has been involved in training uh, hundreds of neurosurgical residents uh, with a practice focused on complex neuro-oncology procedures, uh, serving as the director of McGill's Brain Tumor Research Center in the past few years. He continued research and clinical studies on brain tumors. Uh, his present investigation explores the utility of virtual learning and artificial intelligence in surgical education. Uh, he's also uh, one of the board members of the Osler Library and uh, a curator of intellectual academic works in medicine. And uh, of course, he's very famous for having one of the largest collections of works on Leonardo da Vinci and has a very active interest in Renaissance Italy, uh, which he's a native of, of Italy and of Leonardo da Vinci and the brain. So again, in this presentation, Professor Del Maestro will be sharing his expert insights and opinions, reflect on his uh, illustrious career, and uh, we are very grateful to have Dr. Del Maestro here with us today. So without further ado, Dr. Del Maestro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. You know, <clears throat> when I was thinking about this, my initial um, idea was to put together a slide presentation. And um, I began to do that. And um, after thinking about it for a while and seeing some of the slides, I, I sort of began to think of it. If I was in your boat, in your part of your career, what would I want to know? You know, what, what would be important for me to know? Um, not so much about my career, but about, you know, the flourishing of your career. And so um, what I've decided to do is to sort of think about, um, you know, a career in neurosurgery is sort of a, an arc. And um, that arc really begins with some questions. You know, one of the questions that it begins with is, you know, where do you come from? You know, what, what are you about? You know, the second question is, you know, um, like, where are you going and what do you want to, how do you want to get there? The third question is, you know, what do you want to do when you get there? And the fourth question is, you know, what, what do you do after you're finished doing what you want to do? So there's sort of four different parts of this. And one way you can consider it is it's three lumps, lumps of your life. Somewhere around 20, yeah, 20 to 30 years, and 
neurosurgery, let's say probably more than 30 years of your life will be, um, will be in that first phase. And that first phase will really be involved in the learning of how to actually do what you want to do. And if that's neurosurgery or some other surgical specialty or some other specialty in medicine, that would be what, what you would be involved with. Um, the second phase uh, would really be that those years that you actually perform whatever you want to do in medicine. Uh, in that second phase, there are really three concepts that you have to think about. Uh, do you want to do administration? Uh, do you want to be predominantly involved in clinical care? Or do you want to be involved in an academic pursuit? Or somehow in all three of them? But from what I, what I can figure out, it's very, very difficult to do all three. So in one way, you have to sort of think about it in that way. Although these can be part of your, of your life in, uh, in a neurosurgical career, can it, be, uh, can it be all, you know, can you do all of those things? My, my thinking is it's very difficult to do all of those things. So you have to begin to think about, you know, how, how, are, you gonna, how are you gonna be involved in those three components of the career? If you start with the idea of the first things, well, you know, where do I come from? Well, you know, your class is gonna be very complex in medical school. School. You're going to have individuals, for example, who's, who's, who have a family with a very long, let's say, medical background. You'll have other individuals who have not had any type of background at all or in their family backgrounds as far as medicine or research or administration or any other of those things. And you have to adapt yourself to those types of, of sort of um, ideas. And, you know, I think the other thing is that, you know, what are your skills? You know, what, what skills do you have or had before coming into medical school or have now? For example, are, are your skills um, on academic variety? Uh, have you done, you know, some type of research before? Have you done degrees? Have you done a master's, a PhD, et cetera? Are, are those the skills you're bringing into a medical career to begin with? Uh, do you have certain skills related to your interpersonal relationships? Some individuals have excellent interpersonal relation skills and some people not so much. And so, you know, do you have to sort of work on those skills or are you happy with that idea? Uh, in, in medicine, for example, there are subgroups of individuals who never, never see a patient. They can be people who work in the lab, for example. Uh, they can be people who do, for example, uh, uh, for uh, pathology because you might never see a real live person in that situation. In some radiology sort of uh, areas, again, you never see a, a live person. Uh, and so, you know, you have these decisions that you have to think about as you're going into to medical school. And um, I think as far as neurosurgery is concerned, I think you have to really think of yourself as having two basic skills that you're gonna have to have. Uh, one skill you're going to have to have is you're going to have to have some, some rather important, um, let's say, interpersonal skills. You're gonna, if you don't have them now, you're going to have to begin to sort of work on developing them. And the second thing you're going to have to have is sort of uh, you know, an interest in, in the human body and especially in the nervous system. And so those, all those things have to come together. So <clears throat> when I was thinking about my life, when I was an undergraduate, I was particularly interested in genetics. And the reason for that was I had a genetics prof whose goal it was to, as you know, corn has, you know, sort of one uh, cob on one side, another cob on the other side, where his whole goal was to have two cobs in each side. So the idea being that he could double the amount of corn production from one stock throughout the world. That was a pretty adventurous sort of idea. And he spent his time sort of, you know, doing all kinds of experiments to try to deal with that. But he also was very interested in Drosophila and Drosophila genetics. And so I got interested in Drosophila genetics and did some projects associated with that when I was an undergraduate. And that really taught me two things, I guess, uh, when you come from those types of background. Um, one of the things it teaches you when you come from a, an academic type of background or have academic uh, uh, information in your background 
is that there is sort of a, a process associated with academics. Uh, there's an idea that you have to know the literature. There's an idea that you have to do experiments. You have to do the experiments again and again. Uh, you have to do them carefully. You have to, you know, do, there's a whole sort of system that's associated with doing that. Uh, not everybody likes that type of system at all. The problem with that type of system is that you can do everything that you want to do and are expected to do, and the results can still turn out not important, not enough to publish, et cetera. So, you, you know, if you're thinking about a, an academic career in that way, <clears throat> there are some even disappointments you're gonna have to deal with. And some, sometimes having those experiences before you go into medical school can help you. And if you don't have them, well, maybe, you know, hopefully you'll get some of those, those experiences while you're in medical school. The other thing is <laughs> that, you know, one of the questions that it, it's always come up in my mind is, you know, if you want to be a neurosurgeon in the future, to work in an academic community, which means you're going to work in an academic hospital in an academic city, et cetera, um, it's going to be very difficult if you don't have a PhD. It's, it's just going to be difficult. And the reason for that is that the number of positions are limited and there's sort of an expectation that neurosurgeons uh, are, you know, have those types of skills, not only the technical skills, but some academic intellectual skills that allow the field to be, to move forward. Uh, now this does not in any way disparage the individuals who spend their life taking care of patients because they're an extremely important subgroup of medicine and neurosurgery. But at academic centers in, in let's say North America and other countries, uh, at least in the Western world, uh, you're gonna have to think about that idea. So what is your goal from medical school? Well, the goal from medical school is to get into a residency training program because that's what you have to do at the end. Uh, and to get into the residency training program that you want to get into. So that's the overall goal of your medical school. Now, granted, you have to learn all kinds of things in medical school, like everybody else, <clears throat> but there is a goal. The goal is to get into a, an academic um, residency training program. Uh, and so, would one consider doing a PhD during your medical school? Um, almost all the programs in Canada and many in the United States have MD PhD programs. Uh, what that usually means is you take two years of medical school, then you do a PhD for three or more years, and then you do another two years at the end where you finish your MD. Um, I've had a number of people who have done that in my career, um, and I'm not really a fan of it. Um, and the reason for this is that if you think about it, you have the ability to do a PhD before entering medical school, during medical school, during your residency, and after your residency. So you have the ability to do extra training, masters or PhD in those four time periods during your, your career. Um, I have never, seen an individual after finishing neurosurgical training do a PhD. I've seen some do masters a year or so, but after doing a long sort of residency training program, starting again to do a PhD at that point seems to be sort of beyond what most people can sort of do. So uh, my feeling would be that if you think about doing an MDP, uh, MD PhD, the problem with it is that when your papers are coming out um, from your PhD, uh, they would ho help you get in, for example, to a fellowship program uh, or get into a residency program, but you know, they're, they're gonna be six or seven or more years out of date where you're then applying for your fellowships after, let's say, your neurosurgical training. So those particular 
you know, those particular papers that you've done, the research that you've done at that time, may not be in the area that you're interested in in neurosurgery at all. And also, um, we'll, we'll move forward uh, with the idea that they may not be that terribly relevant uh, seven or eight or 10 years uh, from that particular time period. The advantage of doing a PhD during your residency is that one, usually by that time you know what area of neurosurgery you want to do or whatever specialty you're involved with you want to do. And the second thing you know at that time is that the papers that you're involved with are gonna be available or gonna be coming out when you're applying for a fellowship. And then honestly, a fellowship, if, if you look at it, getting into medical school is one thing. Getting into residency is another. And there is only you know, some 20 positions per year in Canada, 14 centers. And as far as fellowships are concerned, there's many, many less than that. Obviously you have the United States and other places, but they're, they're limited because you're, there's a lot of competition. So the, the, the slope gets a bit steeper as you go up. So that's why if you have papers that are relevant uh, to the area of your interest coming out just when you're applying for your fellowships, that gives you advantages, no question about that. So if I was, if I was to, um, although I considered it, I considered doing a genetics uh, PhD during my uh, MD, I think delaying was at least for me beneficial. And uh, that's, that's the opinion I would have at this particular point in time related to that. The second thing about it is the second question that you sort of get asked all the time is that, you know, what type of research should I do when I'm in medical school? How, how would that help me? Um, I'm a bit of two minds about that. Uh, my first mind is that, you know, one of the individuals, for example, at McGill who, um, uh, is interested in, uh, got a, a Molina scholarship, which I was his supervisor for, um, also got a Fulbright scholarship to do further studies. And you know, the question then becomes, well, do I, do I take a year off of my medical school to do my Fulbright scholarship or to do something else that I'd like to do? Uh, and my answer to you would be yes, you should. And the reason is there'll be no other time that you can do it. You're not gonna do it during your practice and it's gonna be difficult to do it after you retire. So if you're gonna do it, do it during your, your training. And don't be involved, don't, don't ever be concerned about, it, about time. You know, don't be concerned about time. Time will go along and you won't even remember, you'll hardly remember medical school. You will hardly remember. Uh, you probably will remember your residency <laughs> for all kinds of reasons, but you may not remember much of your medical school because it will just fly along and it will just be, a, it's like a preparatory step for you. That's not something that's critical to you from that aspect of it. So the first thing is if, if there are things that you really would like to do, and uh, we'd really like to uh, explore and, and, and explore uh, other aspects of your life, uh, doing them in medical school is a good idea. Uh, and um, I think that um, I would encourage that, excellent. I would encourage you to do, if you have things that you really would like to do, other areas you're interested in, uh, to take, take the time to, to do it during medical school because you, you can get a year off without any trouble or even more if you really want to. No one's gonna be bothered about that. You just have to, you have to apply for it and get it and go on with it. And, um, and you'll be better for it. Uh, that'd be my opinion at, at this particular point in time. Related to actually doing uh, academics, uh, again, you know, one of the things that I would suggest to you, if you have not traveled a lot, and unfortunately this is a time of COVID anyway, but um, there are maybe times during your, your medical school where you can travel, you know, for your clerkships or other things. Um, my suggestion would be to take advantage of those opportunities. Because again, you know, you do have an uh, opportunity during, you know, let's say your fellowship to be in another place, but, but you know, the, the idea is to, to enrich, enrich yourself and to make yourself better in multiple different ways. Um, the other thing I think you should consider doing is to, 
developed the idea of you know having you know some type of uh, book um, that you keep notes in about yourself and about the experience that you've had. And uh, I've not been very good at this. I've done it for, for a time period, and then I haven't because I've gotten too busy or whatever. But if you if you meet certain individuals that have an effect on you, uh, it might be reasonable for you to put that information uh, and write it down uh, because you won't remember it very effectively, you know, 20 years or 30 years later. Second, if you have the opportunity to meet people who are, you know, leaders in their field, um, then and they have something important to say to you, then you should you should put that down somewhere. Uh, and, and your response to that particular idea or concept, because if you don't do that, then what happens is those all are gone. And you, don't, you don't have that interaction with those, those notes. I was looking through, through a few of my notes um, a little while ago, and um, just before um, starting my lab, and I was a bit impressed with, with what I put down. Whether I was able to do it or not, it's another question, but I was impressed that I was thinking about the That's something that would be important for you also. Um, related now to the idea of, um, after I finish with this, I think I'll, I'll, I'll open it for you. Um, is the idea of clerkships. Now, if you think about it, there are, you know, 14 neurosurgical training programs in Canada, I think something like that. There's one in the East, Dalhousie. There's four in, uh, there's four in Quebec, three of which are French speaking. Uh, one is English speaking. Uh, there are uh, four in, in uh, Ontario. Um, and um, the biggest one is in Ontario is, is um, the University of Toronto, which takes at this point takes four neurosurgeons, uh, residents a year. Uh, one in one in Manitoba, one in Saskatchewan, two in Alberta, and one in BC. So you're relatively limited in the number of programs that you could apply for, at least in uh, in Canada. Now that doesn't mean you're limited in the sense of, of applying for uh, uh, residency training programs in the United States, but it is difficult to get into residency training programs in the United States from Canada. Uh, so <clears throat> the next question then becomes, well. In the time of COVID, unfortunately, this year, so let's say students, uh, one of the people in my lab, Robin, uh, is interested in neurology. And uh, he, he, he's doing his medical training at Western and he couldn't have any clerkships at all. Uh, there are substantial disadvantages for you not being able to get a clerkship. You'll, you will probably be able to get, get them and you should take advantage of that. You should consider doing clerkships in places where people feel uh, your mentors or other individuals or you feel are areas that are, um, let's say, potentials for you to be a resident at. In other words, uh, or the, the, the clerkship that you will have will be of such significance that it will put you into a, a different sort of league no, I, I told people the, the story about Dr. Drake before, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll say it again because it has a, there's another part of it to it. You know, when I, when I was uh, interested in uh, neurosurgery, uh, I was also interested in neurology and I wasn't quite sure which of the two to be involved with. And um, I think, you know, it gets down to this issue about cutting into the human body. You know, the neurology um, doesn't do that. Uh, but is involved in lots of different uh, aspects of the nervous system. Uh, Neurosurgery's advantage is it actually does cut into the human body and does make an attempt to deal with the problem that is present. Not my medication or other things, but by actually the, the technical part of, of removing tumors or other aspects like that. So um, when I went to see Dr. Drake, you know, he gave me a a lot of reasons why not to be a neurosurgeon. And um, they included such things as one, there wasn't a lot of jobs um, that, you know, uh, it's a very difficult life related to uh, being a neurosurgeon, uh, related to your family, et cetera. 
Um, but he did say that, you know, people always make room for excellence. And I, I say this again and again, because I think it's really important. If you're excellent at what you're doing, people actually make position for you. They actually will make a position for you. And that's where you have to have to get you at. Your goal has to be to get to the point where you can actually um, be involved in that. Now, the second thing that happened was because obviously I expressed an interest in neurosurgery, he expressed an interest in me. And therefore, when I was thinking about doing a clerkship, he was well aware that there were people in Glasgow at the time who were developing the Glasgow Coma Scale. And he was well aware that this one was, was going to change the way that trauma patients were going to be treated. And he knew the individuals who were involved there and uh, sort of suggested to me because I had another option. My other option was to, uh, uh, to do some work in, in biophysics uh, at the University of Western. Um, his, his suggestion to me was to go there and he would write letters and help me get a position there. Uh, and that was incredibly interesting in one way. One, because he had done that for me. And second, because he, you know, because of his expertise and knowledge about the field, could see where the field was going and actually pointed me a little bit towards that particular field. Uh, that, that field was, was developing at the time. And, you know, imagine, imagine being, you know, a third year, fourth year medical student uh, and spending three months in the center that was developing the Glasgow Coma Scale. You know, that actually being developed at the same time that you're actually there. You know, with all the people that were associated with it. You know, and Dr. Teasdale, who was the individual who, who actually was uh, predominant in developing it, you know, was knighted by the queen. And so you, you, get, you get, you know, many other of the individuals who were there were all, they were able, in Glasgow at that time, they'd able to attract all these really incredible individuals who were all there at the same time. Uh, because that tends to be what happens when you're developing a, um, an, a certain expertise in one particular area. All kinds of people seem to gravitate to that area because they want to be in that enriched environment. They really want to get involved in what's going on. And so when you you know when when you're there and you're you're seeing what's happening and you're seeing how ideas are being generated and ide new ideas are being generated and and how that sort of whole concept you know the idea everything about ICU care was being generated at that time and, and you know there were so many things that were going on so when I came back from that three month time period you know, you're in a situation where one it completely convinces you that, you know, this is what you want to do. You want to be involved in fields that are moving like this, that are, are really moving to help people. And also gave you an impression that you, you have to be around people who are really good at what they're doing, not people who are, you know, who are really, really on the edge of what, what's going on related to the field. So my suggestion again would be, if you, uh, are interested in, let's say, neurosurgery, try to link yourself with mentors uh, that can help you uh, and direct you. Because in one way, what they want to do is they want to help you. They want to help you get, you know, the type of education that will, will be beneficial to you. And, uh, and who knows, maybe in the long run, beneficial to the department, if that's one of the things that they're thinking about. You know, because as people go through your department, you're, you know, as a member of that department, you're always thinking about, is this the type of person that we would like to have in this department over a period of time? Uh, the second thing is, if you haven't been at a department at all uh, in a clerkship, it is difficult for them to think about you because they've never seen you before. And uh, so, one of the ideas is that, you know, you will have during your time period in fourth year, a number of different clerkship possibilities. And you should take those, you know, take the opportunities to, you know, my suggestion would be to think about one that's out of Canada somewhere. So it looks like, you know, you're not completely convinced that, you know, you're, you're ready to broaden your ideas and go to places where are developing new things. And then, you know, one or two, or I'll remember, I remember you may have to consider 
places in Canada that you want to go. Um, now, if you look at Canadian um, neurosurgical training programs, uh, there are some that are stronger than others, and you have to be aware of that. You know, and uh, not all neurosurgical training programs have uh, you know large academic components to them. Most have a very very good um, component related to uh, let's say the clinical aspects. But if you're thinking about you know a uh, center, and let's say you go to a center, and you see that you know the the residents are getting lots of experience. You know, they're very happy there. They're, they're learning there. I mean, those are the types of places you want to go. If you go to a place and you find that, you know, that there's so many fellows that the, the senior residents don't, don't get to hardly do anything, or the, the consultants don't let the residents do very much related to the learning, uh, although the, with, you know, the COMC training situation, that's going to be a bit better, but it's still is still always going to be dependent on what the expectation is from those uh, consultants, for example. Uh, in certain places, the residents are able to do much, much more than in others. And you'll get those experiences by one, talking to the residents, finding out from residents who are in that program and if you're actually working with them. And also, you know, from, from the, you know, what you can see, what have those residents done over a period of time? that have graduated from the, those programs. Have those residents predominantly gone into, let's say, general, general neurosurgical practice, or are some of those individuals you know, leading the neurosurgical training programs across, across the country and across the world? And so you, know, you, you sort of can, can work on some of those aspects of that. And so those are the types of things I would start with. The other thing that I would suggest to you uh, related to that is that, <clears throat> During uh, medical school, uh, uh, relationships are going to develop. And therefore, you know, that's probably where, you know, there's the highest potential that uh, a relationship will develop. It's very difficult, you know, more difficult to develop, let's say, during your residency time period because of the, the constraints and work that you have to do as a resident. So you have to be involved in, in thinking about those things too, because you develop various types of relationships uh, during your uh, medical school. Then you have to think about, you know, how are these going to, you know, uh, uh, progress when I, you know, go into, a, you know, a residency program or the next part of my life, which may not be in the same city, and all those things that have to be decided on that at all those particular time periods. So maybe what I'll do is I'll stop there. And I'll see if there's direct questions related to the idea of, you know, this, this issue of clerkships, the issue of MD, PhD, the issue of, you know, the types of research to be thinking about and what to be thinking about related to your, uh, your time period in, uh, in medical school. So there's got to be a few questions related to that. I'm, I couldn't possibly have covered all the questions at the present time. So if we have a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. No questions at all? So maybe I, I can ask a question directly. Sure. First of all, thank you very much, sir, for your, for your presentation. I mean, as a, as a medical student interested in neurosurgery, it's, it's really important actually for me to get as much insight as possible in, in this career. So especially regarding the, the PhD and the proper timing to do that, my first question, my question would be, we've discussed the possibilities about doing PhD first during medical school, during residency. In my particular case, I was considering doing a PhD right after medical school and before the residency, just to, just to be, you know, more more, speci more specialized in a, a, in a particular subspecialty of neurosurgery. In, in my case, it would be brain tumors. So just to deepen my, my knowledge of that particular field so that I can be more, more goal-oriented once I, once I apply to a neurosurgical pro program. Can you, can you tell me a little bit what could be the, the possible advantages and, and disadvantages of, of uh, such, uh, such choice? Thank you. 
I, th I think in the um, Italian situation, which I don't know super well, but I know a little bit about, um, you know, getting into um, the neurosurgical training programs is really a, a difficult problem. Uh, there's lots of individuals who want to, to go into those programs and obviously not all those individuals can do them. So it's relatively common for people to, to do a PhD beforehand. Um, I think, you know, I, you know, I think each, each, each sort of, you know, country and each sort of system has to, you know, have to work out what you want to do. I think in the, the Italian situation, if, if the real issue is actually getting into a neurosurgical training program, then you, you really have to think about that very seriously. Um, there is a disadvantage that your papers will not be there when you may want to be involved in, let's say, a fellowship at the end of your, uh, of your neurosurgery. But that obviously is, le is less important compared to actually getting into neurosurgery. So in, in Canada, for example, I'm not exactly sure that um, having a uh, MD, PhD um, would help you that much, but it would clearly help you too, for sure. If you did MD, PhD during, during your medical school, for sure, it would be of help too. But the question would be, do you have to do that at this particular point in time? And my own feeling would be that you do not. Um, I think that, that there are possibilities, at least in Canada, for getting into a neurosurgical training program without an MD, PhD. And also then to, to use that time in residency to really, really, really focus on what you want to do. But for example, if you really wanted, you know, one of, one of the issues that comes up in Canada is what happens in Canada is after the first, uh, after the, um, your uh, third year and into your fourth year, you apply for a residency training program. And then what happens is you have your first choice and your second choice. Now you don't have to have a second choice, but let's say you have your first choice. Uh, what then happens is that um, most individuals get uh, interviewed in all uh, the neurosurgical programs that they want to be interviewed at. And then the neurosurgical program will rank you from one to whatever the number is. And then you will rank them also. And therefore what happens is if you rank someone first and they rank you first, then you have a position at that particular that particular center. The problem that occurs at some of the centers, like for example, if you're in Quebec, which has four uh, uh, medical schools, uh, in that situation, they don't, the three French ones do not participate in the match to the same extent as the English ones. And the second thing is uh, related to uh, uh, Quebec is that they only allow two individuals to be trained every year for four medical schools. So you can end up in a situation that just for straight luck, there are no positions that year at McGill for a neurosurgical resident. That has not happened in, in other, you know, it doesn't happen in Ontario to my knowledge in many other places, uh, but it does happen in Quebec. Uh, and all the uh, and so, for example, in Kingston, which is another, uh, there's um, another university there. They don't have a program, but they have people coming through, you know, which may spend some time there or whatever. And so, you know, di different places have have different ways of, of sort of doing it. So that made my question. That my answer there. I I think what you have to decide on what what's the best way of getting getting into a program. Um, and the other thing is to interact with people who are at your particular center. If you think that, you know, your particular center um, in Milan is where you would like to do your training, well, then, you know, you should, you should try to develop contacts and other things there to try to uh, make it more likely that you would be chosen there. Now, I can give you one bit of other advice. Uh, when I was, when I decided that I was interested in neurosurgery and came back from Glasgow, um, and um, had other uh, time periods on the neurosurgical service. Uh, you know, I went in on Saturdays 
in the morning when the residents made rounds. And I went in on Sunday in the morning when the residents made rounds. And the reason I did that was one, I was really interested in you know, the patient care and that aspect. But the other reason was that the residents would know me too, because the residents are part of the decision-making process. You know, they interview you also, and they want to know that you're the type of person that they can work with. So that's another thing you have to be aware of, that if you um, come across poorly to residents, they just won't be involved with, with helping you get into that program. They'll pick, on some, they'll pick someone who they're more comfortable with because they are going to have to work with you for a number of years. You know, a first year resident is going to have to work with you for at least five years or six. So, you know, you're going to be around a long time. So they want to make sure that they can work with you, that you're, you know, you're, you're the type of person that they would like to have um, around. And you're the type of person that would not be a problem for them you know, to train or to be involved with. So, you know, that's another thing that's important for you to try to interact with the resident staff. The other thing I would be careful about is that, you know, one of the problems when you get, you know, an extra degree, whether it's an MD, PhD, or the degree that you're gonna, let's say, consider getting after doing medical school, or even a degree in, in uh, when you have, let's say, a PhD degree in, um, uh, during your residency, uh, there is a tendency for, you know, the idea that, you know, you have to be very careful not to project yourself as knowing more than other people do. You know, you don't want to have people consider you to be a prima donna of some sort, you know, just because you happen to do a PhD that makes you better than other people. There's no better way for you to get, you know, into difficulty. So you really have to be careful about that. It's a very, um, you know, I think, I think if, if I was to think back, um, it's, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's a problem though, because what happens is you know so much more than they do, than your teachers do about a particular area. And, it, and you have to learn to, to put that information in such a way that it doesn't threaten them in some way, that you actually know more than they do. Because people don't like to be threatened. You know, people don't, you know, no, no individuals like to be threatened. So again, you have to learn this interaction within, with, between people to try to, to, try to deal with, with this knowledge and, and problem that you, that you uh, may have at that particular time period. Um, you know, I, I, when I came back from my, doing my PhD in, in, uh, in um, Uppsala in Sweden, you know, I, I was pretty knowledgeable about free radical biology. I was pretty knowledgeable about how, you know, rachidonic acid worked, all the prostaglandins, all that aspect of it. I knew all the reactions and everything like that. But you couldn't go to walking down. You couldn't be in the intensive care unit and say, well, the reason the steroids are working is because they're, you know, they're, they're influencing this particular reaction, and not influencing that particular reaction. You know, I know why, I, you know, people have, uh, you know, uh, various problems associated with aspirin, and, you know, because it hits this particular, I mean, you knew all that, and other people didn't. So you just have to be careful uh, to integrate, you know, your knowledge in a very careful type of way from that aspect. It's one of the things you just have to do. It's not a perfect answer, but it's the answer I have. Other questions about the, the medical school time period? Thank you. Any other questions? One of the questions, uh, Dr. Dolmeister, that some people have, and there's a variety of conflicting opinions about this, is about uh, do programs tend to value more research productivity in the number of papers that are published, or do they look more on the authorship list and the degree of work that is done in the number of papers? Could you share some insights about that uh, from your experiences as well? Generally speaking, if what people, well, I think, I think people want to know two things. One, um, are you able to work with a group? In other words, you know, are you able, you know, when you're doing a paper or whatever, you know, are there a number of other people who are involved in that particular group and you're able to work as a group to, to find a particular problem? So that, that's important. Uh, are the numbers important? 
well, if you if you have you know 26 and someone else has one, then obviously that's going to be an issue. But if your one happened to be uh, you know uh, a very important paper that is being you know that is having a big big impact on the um, on the field. That probably is a little bit more important than, for example, doing multiple sort of uh, let's say. Um, studies associated with you know the 14 cases of this and 12 cases of that and the one case of this or whatever although i've always thought that it's important for you to to you know be involved in the writing process because you know a paper involves a whole bunch of different concepts you know one concept is you have to put the paper together you have to write it you have to submit it you get you get the reviews back sometimes you get rejected and you you, you have to learn to go through all that aspect of it and um, I think that's a very good learning experience. Um, on balance though, they want to know that you have potential. That's basically what they want to know. Uh, clearly, if you've done, a, you know, uh, produced uh, substantial numbers of papers, obviously you, you have potential. Uh, if you have not uh, done any, then clearly you're not gonna, you know, unless there's some other reason why they may pick you, um, you know, that, that's a disadvantage. But Matt, you know, what, what you're involved with is, let's say there's gonna be 20 people coming to McGill, for example, who are interested in doing uh, the program there. Now in reality, maybe only five or six are really interested, but if you had to choose, if you had to choose you know, where are you going to put McGill in your list? Uh, and so if that year there happens to be a position and you feel that uh, that's the best place for you to go, then, and that, then you, you know, you put that, you put that as your number one. Uh, hopefully you, the people that um, McGill would also put you as number one if they felt that you had the highest potential of, of advancing the program and making the program better and, Etc. Uh, but you know you don't know that. You know you don't know that. But if you're from McGill, clearly there's a higher likelihood that you're going to pick by McGill. Uh, you know, much higher likelihood. Uh, so you know you have to be aware of that too. That where you're trained, because people know you and know you better, there's certainly a much higher possibility that you're going to be picked there in some places. Uh, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't be picked as Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, and other places like that, not at all. But um, it is, that's probably your best shot. And if that's not available to you, then you have to think of what's your second best shot and try to you know, develop the relationships and the, the interactions with that in their second best situation. I can also tell you, sitting around these committees for a lot of my life, if one of the individuals one of the neurosurgeons on the committee or one of the individuals on the committee for whatever reason has had an experience with you, which is not, let's say complimentary, that can, that can hurt you a lot. So you have to be aware that you know, all these things interact over time. And you, you basically have to be aware of that, you know, these interactions that you have with people are, are really critical overall. Other questions? No other questions? Come on now, guys. <laughs> I, I had a question actually. Um, so uh, thank you so much for um, talking a little bit about um, the job market and uh, how uh, basically that works. But I was just wondering uh, if you could just speak a little bit more to that and uh, maybe uh, explain um, just, or give us an idea uh, how the hiring process is in Canada and and maybe talk a little bit about more about the job market as um, as you've actually mentioned some people um, especially for neurosurgery just because of the long training and the fellowships and uh, potentially the PhDs that um, uh, essentially residents have to do and go through um, and the uncertainty that comes with uh, securing a job position uh, it's it's a bit uh, it's basically one of the factors I think um, that deter people away. So um, I was wondering if you could 
let us know a little bit about the job market um, and how the hiring process goes, but also uh, maybe um, you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how um, uh, someone could, uh, you know, feel encouraged to uh, still go for neurosurgery if that is what they're interested in. Yeah, well, well, you know, I can tell you about uh, two things. Uh, one, um, one of the ma individuals who did his master's in uh, my lab uh, about two years ago, his interests happened to be in orthopedics. Uh, and he did not get chosen the first time. And um, so he had only put orthopedics as his only choice. And so he was not chosen in the first go through. And so his, his idea was, well, uh, I will do a master's and uh, I will apply again. And so he did a master's and uh, he, did a, he did a an excellent job. Uh, he ended up on five or six different papers uh, and some, some high ranking papers and uh, then applied again after his master's to the orthopedic program. And then he came and talked with me and he said, you know, what happens if I don't get in again? And I said, well, you know, an option would be that you do a PhD. Paulo, this, this is another way to go about the problem. <laughs> but you do a PhD and then you apply again. Uh, and then he said, well, I'm not sure I want to do that. And then the real question is, well, how much do you really want to be a orthopedic surgeon. Uh, his his uh, father was a general practitioner. And he said, well, what I could do is I could uh, have a secondary choice and my secondary choice would be general practice. And I would try to do, let's say, extra training and pain management and other things like that. So I could be sort of involved in neurosurgical like problems but uh, obviously I wouldn't, be a I wouldn't be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm sorry about saying neurosurgeon, he was orthopedic. And then I came at him with the same question again. I said, you realize of course, that if you don't get into orthopedics and you choose as your second choice general practice and a program chooses you, you are legally bound to go into the general practice program. You have no legal option to not go into that program. So you have to be very, very sure that, that you're okay with that. And I, I sort of sent him off for a day or two to think about it. And he came back and he said, well, you know, I do not think I really want to spend the rest of my life as a general practitioner. And therefore I will only apply again to neurosurgery. Uh, sorry, to orthopedic surgery, to orthopedic surgery. And I said, well, then, you know, you have a backup plan. Your backup plan, if you don't get in, is, you know, you can go on to do your, your PhD and you know, we'll get funding for you and stuff. And so what happens is that he applies for uh, orthopedics, gets into orthopedics at Queens, which, you know, he never thought he would get into, but I think doing his master's and getting that number of papers allowed him to get into the orthopedic program at, at Queens. And therefore he's now in my third or fourth year or whatever he happens to be into at the present time. So you have to be aware that, you know, if you want to do something and you want to do it um, for sure, then, you know, there are, you know, sometimes it does take a little bit longer to do this. For the people who were on the call who are uh, not in medicine at this particular point in time, um, I had two, I had a nephew and a niece who uh, their mother and fathers were both doctors and uh, they wanted to do medicine. Uh, the one did not get into a, a program in, in Canada at all. Uh, but their parents are, were wealthy enough that they could uh, pay for their, that individual to go to the University of Dublin. And that individual uh, went to the University of Dublin, got his degree there, came back, 
The problem when you do that is you have a little less option related to the programs you can get into. But is now functioning as a as a family you know family doctor uh, and quite happy at that. Uh, the uh, the sister uh, applied for ten years to get into medical school uh, and then got accepted. During those ten years, uh, she did a master's. Uh, she worked in health uh, care, and she eventually did get in. And now, uh, uh, although she's 40, has two kids, you know, she's finished her residency and is presently uh, uh, doing what she wants to do. So you can, you know, if you don't take time as being your only constraint, you can, you know, get, get things done that you want to. Um, but I also, you know, suggest to you that you had have a secondary plan. The secondary plan being, what if I don't get into whatever I want to do? Now, my secondary plan was, back to you, Paulo, my secondary plan was, if I didn't get into neurosurgery when I applied, that I would indeed do a PhD. I would indeed do that. And then apply again. That was my secondary plan. Uh, because I really did not want to do anything else at that point in time. Now, let's say you do a PhD and you still don't get into it. Well, then you have to make some really big decisions. You know, then you make really big decisions. Well, do you want to be, you know, do you switch over to neuro, uh, let's say neuroanesthesia, do you switch over to neuroradiology? Do you, you know, do you switch over to neurology? And you know, what 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 do you do in that situation? One of my one of the reasons I, I had previously had started in ear, nose, and throat and really did not like ear, nose, and throat at all. Uh, and then I was able to switch into neurosurgery. So there are ways, you know, of, of moving around. Um, it's a little bit hard, but it can be done if you, if you really want to do what you want to do. Um, I think the real, the real secret is probably this idea of what Dr. Drake said, you know, that people always make room for excellence. So you have to get yourself in a position where you're excellent at what you're doing. And if you're excellent at what you're doing, you know, it will break for you, I think. The vast majority of times it breaks for your favor. And you have to, you have to believe it's gonna happen. That's basically what you do, you believe it's gonna happen. Uh, the vast majority of times it does, to be honest with you, in my experience. And so, but sometimes it doesn't always happen the way you want to happen. Sometimes you have to, you know, be at it a little bit longer, do things a little bit different. Other questions? Hopefully that helped a little bit. Me as a question, Dr. Del Maestro. So thank you so much for the great presentation. So um, since you're, you're working closely with AI, and we know that there are a lot of effort to like incorporate new, new technologies to, the, to medicine and to surgery specifically. So I have two questions regarding that. So first question is that, um, so how do you see the role of the um, AI, machine learning, or other technologies in the neurosurgery specifically in the next 10 years or 20 years? And then how important it is for someone like us that, who is interested in neurosurgery to get himself or herself familiar with the, these new technologies from at the time that they're in the med school? There is no question in my mind that in within five years, there's gonna be smart instruments in the upper room. Uh, and they're going to assess um, how operations are being done. Um, there's no question in my mind that over the next period of time, while you're training as a neurosurgeon or any other type of surgical specialty, you're going to have to reach certain milestones or certain benchmarks on simulators. Um, the question of how quickly that's going to happen um, is difficult to know. I think the COVID, the COVID problem has really shown a big, big issue. And the big issue is, for example, in many centers across North America, the senior residents are not operating now because all the, all the elective surgery is shut off. If that occurs for months, as it is occurring in certain places, then you're not gonna be as trained as you should be. 
And there is a large number of individuals who are really pushing for the idea that we have to rethink the training program. Competency is one part of it, you know, that you're going to be more competent uh, related to that, but also to have other benchmarks or other things that people can actually test you on before they let you out in the real world. Uh, the second thing, I think at some point, the community is going to want to make sure that when you are, a you know, a, a, have a specific skill in surgery, that your skills are being maintained, not because you have just read articles about it, um, but because you actually can prove that you have certain skills and those skills are approximately the same as you had before. So there will be information that will be available that way. Uh, there, in the reality of it, to give you some idea, uh, Alex, who's doing a PhD in the lab now, I think you've seen Alex before, you know, he, uh, he got a fellowship in the best US program that's available. Uh, part of that is one he's, he's uh, you know, he's, uh, he's published a lot. But part of it is also that, you know, we published a, an article in, in JAMA on artificial intelligence and, and this and that. And I think those are the types of skill sets that people are really, really interested in right now. There is no question about it in my mind. I think one of the reasons that these individuals, for example, are doing well, almost everybody out of the lab has gotten whatever fellowship they wanted to get whether it's at Harvard or other places, they, they just seem to be able to do that. And part of it is because right now, I think the neurosurgical community is, is knowledgeable enough to know that this is gonna be the future. And um, if you don't have these skills in your department, you're not gonna be able to compete. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, those skills are an important skill set. Now, another important skill now, for example, there's no question if you're interested in that same brain tumors, clearly understanding the genetics of brain tumors, understanding the invasion of brain tumors and all that is very important. But if you can not only do that, but then apply artificial intelligence to the data, then that puts you one sort of cycle above. And, um, you know, when I was, you know, when I, when I was involved in training neurosurgeons, um, there, there are, there's a lot of defects in that. One is that some, some residents got through the program and are barely competent. You do not want to be barely competent as a neurosurgeon because that's a very, very scary world to live in being barely competent. You want to be more than competent. You want to be expert in what you're doing. You don't want to be competent at all. You want to be expert in whatever skill set you want to do. So to be expert in what you want to do, you rather have to have, you know, whether it's the 10,000 hours or however you want to think about it, you have to put together a series of skill sets, um, both clinical and non-clinical that allow you to, to compete. Um, one of the things that's interesting is um, and I'm, I'm going to sway a little bit, you know, a little bit, Mohammed, here from, from what I was talking about is that when I was training, one of the individuals I trained with uh, was Dr. Hugh Barr. And you will not have known, will not very much have heard his name, uh, but he was a very, very excellent surgeon. And his other expertise was dealing with family doctors. And uh, those, that's, you know, I learned a lot from that. You know, when there was a problem with one of his patients, he would phone the family doctor and outline what the problems had been. And uh, the family doctors were, were engaged with him in the taking care of those patients. And when I saw that compared to other individuals who never, other neurosurgeons who never took any time or effort his practice was massive, absolutely massive. He couldn't keep up with the problem in all the cases that he had. And other individuals are trying to do a few cases and he had so many that were beyond the pale. 
And when the carotid endarterectomy trial came along, and you'll hear about this later, one of the issues was that when I was a Western uh, uh, neurologist by the name of Dr. Barnett did not believe that carotid endarterectomy was useful. And so a very large trial was, was funded by the, uh, by the US basically uh, to do a double bond, well, to do a trial in which half the individuals had a carotid endarterectomy and the other half were treated with full medical care. Uh, Dr. Barr put in more patients into that trial than anybody in North America by a lot. Why was he able to do that? Because he had developed these incredible relationships with the family doctors and other referring physicians. So that is a, you know, you know, I, I can't emphasize to you how important that is. If another thing you take away from this is when you become a neurosurgeon, be extremely aware that your patients, how well your patients will do is dependent on you, but is also depending on the nursing staff, the physiotherapy staff, the family doctor that the patient goes back to, or the clinic that the patient goes back to, the rehab center. And if you have good relationships with them, they put an extra effort into your patients. They just do. They just do because they like you. They know that you're gonna put a, a huge effort into their patient and you would put a huge effort into their family member. So what happens is believe it or not, their family members start coming to you if they have a, a problem. And that's some type of respect that they have for your skill set. You know, so that's an important aspect of it too. Uh, the other thing I suggest to you is when you're on the floor with your, your surgical colleagues, whether it's general surgery, whatever surgical specialty, carefully assess how that individual talks to its patients. In other words, does that individual listen to what his patients are saying? Or is he the type of individual or she the type of individual that opens the door and says, are you okay today? You know, sort of, you know, begin to sort of assess, you know, those types of activities and to try to get an idea of what, what that actual uh, individuals involved with. And um, what I can tell you is as far as uh, we can go on as far as being a resident or whatever, but um, you know, as a resident, I think you have to, um, if you take good care of the patients, you're, whatever the consultant is, the consultant loves the idea of, of coming in in the morning and saying, oh, doctor and such and such came in and you know, he, he's asking me all kinds of questions and helping me, you know, and sorted this out for me or sorted that out for me. Or I told him about this problem, he dealt with it right away. You know, those are the things that make, that make you have an impact um, as a medical student or, or a resident. That, that, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to take that away from that aspect. Of it. All right, other questions? So the, the quick answer to the question is that I think that, um, um, you know, I think that you, you have to develop both sets of skills. You know, those, those personal skills, those interactive skills, and those other skill sets. Because you have to remember that if, if a family doctor, he has a choice of referring it to you or to some other huge number of other neurosurgeons that might be in the area. And therefore, you know, if you provide excellent care, uh, that helps you in the long run, no question about it. Other questions? Question. Um, thank you, Dr. Del Maestro, for, for the talk so far. Um, so you touched on sort of two different sets of qualities that kind of at times almost act in opposition against each other. The first one being like likability or humility and not overstepping. Um, and then the second one being like about competence and, and showing that you have like extensive knowledge. So when it comes to clerkship, do you have like any advice on finding this balance between not being a know-it-all, but also showing that you could eventually have the potential of being a know-it-all? <laughs> well, uh, it's good to see you, by the way. Um, I, uh, I think that's, that's a, it's a learning issue that you have to deal with. My feeling would be if you're, if you're interested 
and you show your interest by being there, uh, by listening to the, um, you know, the, uh, the residents who are making rounds or <clears throat> the patient, et cetera. And then uh, if you, if you uh, ask certain questions, uh, and the questions are questions that um, the other individuals are interested in, uh, sometimes what will happen if they don't know the answer, they'll ask you to look it up. Um, or they'll say to you, you know, uh, you, should, you know, uh, you know, what are your what are your thoughts about this this type of problem? And you can outline it in a sort of a, a more um, let's say um, situation where you you're more uh, able to. There's a certain humility in knowledge. You know, for example, the vast majority of people who um, who are really knowledgeable are relatively humble because they know that knowledge evaporates very quickly and new knowledge takes its place. And if you're not able to, if you're stuck on old knowledge, that's probably a very, very bad sort of things that, um, <clears throat> that uh, you can do in your life is to be stuck in, in a certain knowledge brackets. So my suggestion would be that you have to, you know, you have to be able to start to judge what's happening around you. You know, for example, you know, watch other people and see how other people deal with this problem. Watch a very good mentor or a very good physician uh, interact with their patients and learn from that. Uh, do not learn from individuals who do not have good interactive skills. Do not criticize them, however. Do not criticize them in front of them. Do not criticize them in front of anybody else. But be aware that there are some people that have incredible skills and you learn from those individuals. And do not take on bad skills. You know, try to stay away from those types of skills because sometimes you get angry and sometimes people actually are wrong, you know? I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was involved in a particular case where uh, it was a young man that, that had, had a, um, a particular issue uh, with uh, a type of brain tumor. Uh, and I was asked for a second opinion. And uh, my, my particular opinion working with an oncologist was there was a way of trying to treat this problem. Um, uh, however, the, uh, the person who was a consultant uh, said that uh, he didn't think that that was needed at all. And so in those types of situations, uh, what you have to do is that individual is the patient's doctor you are being asked for a second opinion. Um, there is no worse, that particular individual does not have to take that opinion. Uh, it is just an opinion that you're expressing on the basis of uh, the expertise you have. Uh, and in that particular situation, that individual, that individual uh, was wrong. Uh, our opinion was a better opinion um, related to that. Uh, so, you know, I think um, you know, there's certain things that's hard to, to accept. Uh, you'll see individuals who do things that you will not believe in your life, which will not be the best thing for that patient. But unfortunately, in the system that we have, you should just learn from that. That's what you do. You learn from that so you don't make that mistake in the future. But you cannot, it's very hard to, uh, uh, I'll tell you another story for that aspect. I was just in practice, just started my practice. And I came to the, the locker room and I noticed that one of the uh, nieces was drinking out of a bottle. And he looked at me and he said, you won't, you won't tell anybody about this, will you? I didn't say anything. There was no one else in the room. And so I was thinking, oh, oh you know, what, what should I do? So I went to the chief of neurosurgery and I said, uh, this is what I saw. And um, the discussion went like this. You realize, of course, that you were, you saw him, but no one else did. 
You see, uh, you realize, of course, that he'll deny everything. Yes, I realize that. Uh, you realize that what will happen is that the, every anesthetist in the hospital will, will not be very happy with you. And what will, may happen is when your case is on the board to be done at night, they may delay it or they may not think it's as important as normally they would because uh, having a feeling about you that you're not respective, respectable uh, of their, you know, their colleague. Uh, and I thought about that. And because of the fact that it may have affected my patients, I decided to be quiet and not to say anything. Uh, a number of weeks later, uh, an arrest occurred in one of the other operating rooms where that individual was the anesthetist. And uh, he uh, was not present in the operating room and was drinking. And that patient died. The lesson for me was so I should have gone to the chief of anesthesia too. And I should have said, this is what I saw. And I just want you to be aware that this is what I saw. And it's up to you if you want to open this locker at some point and see if there's something in there. So the idea of going to my own um, chief was was good, but there was another there was another bit of knowledge that I could have or another avenue that I could have taken that potentially would not have resulted in that that fatality. So in one way, in one way, you could argue that I am responsible for that fatality. Uh, but I was young then. Uh, I would do it differently now. You know, I would do it differently now. Uh, so uh, you have to be, you know, you have to be aware of uh, that you're going to be put in situations where it's going to be difficult for you. And um, the only thing I can tell you is um, try to be as humble in your knowledge as you can, but make sure you use it for patient care. Use all the knowledge you have for patient care. That would be my other thought. Now, the other suggestion I have for you when patient care is be extremely appreciative of the individuals who clean the floor, who take care of your patients, the nurses and all the other staff. Um, if that individual doesn't clean the floor properly or disinfect that particular room properly, a perfectly good operation that you've done, the patient could get an infection and die. So that person is very, very important. So you have to respect them, know their names, talk with them, and interact with them. So they, you know, what happens is if you do that, you know, they, they do a better job. It's a very simple way. They just do a better job. And it's the same thing with the nursing staff. You know, if you respect the nursing staff, respect that they're, uh, or any other staff member, doesn't matter who it is, that they have special expertise and that you're able to, um, to interact with that special expertise and thank them and make sure that they're, they're with you on that and never be involved in degrading or anything like that, then it, it works better for your patients because they'll take care of your patients better. I always said, if you have um, you know, a caregiver who let's say doesn't get you a relatively sick patient to cough, uh, for eight hours, your, your patient's going to have pneumonia. Simple as that. You can't be there. So those people have, you know, those people have to be involved with the process to, to help. And if you're, if you're, um, people respect that. People respect, like one of the things I always said, I would write down on the chart. If it happened to be, a, you know, someone, I would say, make sure that that particular patient has, gets their lipstick on, gets their hair, you know, washes their hair, uh, gets up, gets her clothes on, and stuff like that. And the reason is because psychologically, psychologically, a person's 
look well when other people come in. You know, if you have a brain tumor operation and your family comes in the next day, you're in your clothes and you've got your lipstick on and you haven't taken very much hair off, it has an incredible impact on the patient's ability to get better. They're all soft. They're all soft things. But these soft things make such a difference in your patients and how well they do. And so, um, you know, learn the softness about, about medicine. You know, there's a, there's a way of, of dealing with these things. And if you can do that, you'll always do very, very well. Yeah. Professor Del Maestro, we have uh, three more questions left. Uh, would you like me to read the questions all at once or would you like to go one at a time? How about one at a time? One at a time, okay, sure. So the first question is coming from Barzani and he asks, as medical students, when we shadow, how do we feel we should conduct ourselves? What would we have to demonstrate to make the best impression? Which I think you somewhat touched on, but if you want to lap on some of these ideas. I think, I think the easiest thing to think about is there's a certain humility as I just talked with Sarah. You know, that you're, you're very um, um, uh, supportive of the fact that this particular individual is allowing you to do it because he doesn't, he or she does not have to do this. Um, and that um, you're, uh, and that if, you know, you, you ask questions that, uh, that are pertinent and uh, that you are very, uh, you know, respectful of that individual's time and, and at the time of the residence at from that point of view. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a process of just, You'll learn by other individuals to watch other individuals and how they act and try to model yourself on, on those types because you'll find certain residents are very, very good interacting with that particular staff. And you can, you can model yourself on those particular interactions and relationships. And uh, I, th I think that's the way I would do it from that aspect at this point in time. Great, the next question is from Mosefa. And he asks, are there any qualities that can help us understand what makes a great mentor? This question can apply to PhD training or medical school and onwards. Um, I think the quickest answer to that is that you will know it. As Soon as you see this individual interact with patients or interact with other individuals or in the operating room, you will know that this individual has skills and uh, those skills will, um, uh, are the skills that you want to emulate and you want to be involved with. Um, and so I, I think it's not, it's not so much a process of, of uh, giving you a list, but you will know it, you know it immediately that um, it's, it's an important aspect of it. Great, and then we have one more question from Sherry and uh, the question reads, if we are considering a PhD or other training or want to take a break in general following medicine, but before doing the fellowship, would you be concerned about our clinical skills uh, diminishing or weaning? Yeah, people always ask me that. <clears throat> you know, the question is, you know, if you're in neurosurgical training and you take three years off to be, um, you know, to get um, some other type of uh, expertise and then come back to, to surgery. Um, I personally do not think uh, if you've developed a series of, of skill sets, um, what basically happens in your own brain is you develop a certain knowledge, emotion, knowledge involving your fingers, et cetera. And um, that uh, does not go away if you repeat it, you know, if, you're, if you've done it multiple times. So I have not been particularly concerned about that. I think what's more important in that situation is that you'll get the skill set back um, very quickly. Um, but the important thing about it is you'll add all, add all kinds of new skills that you had not had before. So those, those will be the skill sets that you'll be able to deal with. So I wouldn't worry about, do not worry about that. It will not, it will not substantially influence you in any way, shape or form. Right, uh, great. Yeah, so uh, we're essentially coming to the end, uh, end of our session. And so I would, like to just take this time to uh, sincerely thank Dr. Del Maestro for joining us today. Um, it has been a great pleasure and honor for us to host you and uh, listen to your uh, personal stories and the experiences and the reflections that you have shared with us. Um, they have been absolutely amazing. So thank you again for joining us.